Yeah, good evening, uh, Professor Reddy. Uh, sir, welcome, sir. Welcome to the afternoon. Mm -hmm. I was actually giving some urgent emails. That's why, you know. Was... Sir. OK. Sir, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce to the participants. OK. They'll be joining. Uh, right now, 23 are there. Another 50 more to join. They'll be joining within okay. a few minutes. So I'll start with your uh, brief uh, introduction, sir. OK. So good evening to all the participants. So for this uh, evening session, we have with us Professor uh, B.V.S. Vishwanathan from IIT Mumbai to deliver the eighth lecture of our uh, uh, eighth lecture of our faculty development program on uh, shallow and deep foundations. Uh, Professor Vishwanathan will be delivering a lecture on the topic of pile foundations. Uh, he will be discussing in detail about the classification of pile foundations and uh, uh, load, ca load uh, capacity of piles in soils as well as uh, I think in rocks. So before he takes over, uh, I'll give a very brief introduction of uh, Professor uh, B.S. Vishnogam. Uh, he obtained his uh, PhD from uh, Ruhr University of uh, Bochum, Germany in uh, November 1996. He obtained his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Andhra University of Shaipatnam. And thereafter, did his uh, Master of Technology in uh, Civil Engineering with, Ge with Geotechnical Engineering as specialization from uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, in the year 1989. And uh, I'm happy to mention that uh, SAR happens to be my senior at IIT Madras. And uh, we had uh, we have worked under the same guide, Professor N. R. Krishnaswamy at IIT Madras. Before joining uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, in December 1998, he worked as a senior project officer uh, uh, at Department of Forest Engineering, IIT Madras, and as a scientist, Geotechnical Engineering Division, Central Road Research Institute, New Delhi, for about uh, 11 years. Currently, Professor Shnadam is uh, the Dean, Infrastructure Planning and uh, Support at IIT Bombay, and he is serving as Professor in Department of Civil Engineering with geotechnical engineering as a specialization. Uh, before uh, taking over as a, a full-time dean, earlier he has also worked as associate dean of uh, infrastructure planning and support from uh, August 2011 to December 2015. So that means over the last 10 years, he is associated with uh, infrastructure uh, planning and uh, development activity of IIT Mumbai. He has vast uh, uh, construction experience also. He is handling a large number of constructions uh, uh, in IIT Bombay, apart from offering uh, consultant services to outside organizations. Professor Shinodami is working in IIT Bombay since uh, December 1998, and he is elevated to the position of a professor in 2009. The research interests of uh, Professor Vishnadam are uh, Centrifuge model studies on behavior of uh, geotechnical structures, environmental geotechnics with special reference to landfill waste containment systems and slope stability, ground improvement using geosynthetics, and uh, studies on behavior of geosynthetic reinforced soil structures, natural hazard mitigation, landslides, and uh, slope protection. And uh, he is also uh, working in the area of uh, bulk utilization of. Uh, various uh, waste materials. He, he has published uh, 198 plus technical papers in peer-reviewed international and national journals and uh, international national conferences. He is uh, involved in consolidation projects uh, related to closure of landfills, canal bonds design and analysis, shoring system designs, foundation design, info soil walls design and construction ground improvement techniques for soft clay and liquefaction uh, remediation, ge geomembrane or GCL characterization, evaluation and development of alternative barrier materials, slope stabilization, soil nailing, gabion walls, and so on. So he is into each and every area of geotechnical engineering. Uh, he is offering consultancy services and he is very popular for his teaching, research, and uh, for his consulting services. 
uh, he is very active in building a strong relationship with the infrastructure industry in undertaking sponsored research and uh, consulting projects with this uh, brief introduction uh, i invite uh, professor b s krishnadam sir to deliver his lecture on the topic of file foundations please sir yeah thank you professor uh, reddy uh, now i can say that you became expert now <laughs> so uh, i think uh, uh, we are having about 24 uh, i think 36 participants are there if i am seeing this number correctly and uh, so can you professor reddy can you unshare your presentation uh, i can share okay yeah. so thank you for a nice introduction and uh, let me see uh, so tomorrow also i have uh, one hour slot is there isn't it morning 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 i have yeah yeah i'm just opening that one uh are you able to see the screen uh, professor reddy ah it is visible sir okay so uh, at the outset uh, you know i'd like to thank uh, uh, you know professor uh, reddy for uh, giving this opportunity uh, to share uh, you know our uh, some experience whatever uh, we actually have been actually doing at iit bombay and uh, and i understand that this is a faculty development program and uh, recently uh, please uh, you know professor reddy actually has done a wonderful job in uh, conducting uh, you know mega conference in uh, visakhapatnam and in fact it is first time in maybe in the civil engineering community that much big uh, conference and uh, so that uh, credit goes to him for his hard work and uh, you know meticulous planning so i openly uh, commend now uh, because of his achievement so what you are seeing in the backdrop uh, is the subsoil at 3 uh, meter below uh, you know our uh, uh, just uh, you know few meters away from the department of civil engineering what you see is uh, you know this uh, filled up soil and there is another uh, type of uh, red color soil has come and then uh, there is some silty type of soil has come and uh, then weathered rock and uh, there is an intact rock this is actually we excavated for 3.5 meters to 4 meters for one of the buildings which is for sign incubation center on incubation center and industrial research and consultation uh, center and one school of design building is a combined building and uh, for the basement uh, we, we actually have done uh, a rough foundation and uh, we are actually using uh, the first time efficient uh, basement uh, system uh, just building is getting completed okay you can see the part of the foundations here and this is actually at the time the anchor testing was going on so i was there at that site so that picture i marked here for the background so uh, you know before uh, going into the details of the lecture uh, you know we should understand about uh, our uh, soil deposits okay uh, you know where if, uh, for example you know majority of our uh, soils the peninsula is uh, estimated as around, as around 6300 km or so the length of the peninsula is about 6300 km so from here from western side to eastern side and if you look into that all soils which are there are all soft clay sand say for example here somewhere here chennai port trust is there and uh, some uh, somewhere here, here vishakhapatnam port trust is there and uh, you know where some pardeep port trust is there then calcutta port trust all are on natural ports which are on the uh, you know this side and uh, this side if you look into that kandla port trust is there very close to this kink and then we have uh, tutkal import trust and uh, you know the of course chennai port trust is here and so these if you look into that all these port trust which are actually there they are all on soft clays okay 
and uh, the one more interesting point uh, is that all these soil deposits which are there are soft in nature and they are basically called normally consolidated soils normally consolidated soils and unfortunately we don't have any glaciation or something like that in north I northern ireland or something like that where otherwise you will see the soil projecting into the sea and it is as hard as, as, hard as rock but we have very soft clays because we don't have any glaciation or prehistory of uh, you know forming more consolidated clays and all so because of that lot of engineering is actually happening along these uh, you know uh, stretches because of developmental works where mumbai is there where jain jnpt is there mumbai port trust and all where lot of uh, this uh, you know uh, you know uh, soft clay work actually is required to be taken because of this okay then we have another major chunk is that uh, black cotton soils which are there okay and then some lateritic soils and uh, boulder clay deposits were in jammu and kashmir and uh, this area and delhi area and northern area you actually have got uh, you know alluvial soils so if you look into that north to south and east to west actually you have got different types of soils this put to us you know uh, in a number of challenges as far as geotechnical engineering is concerned or geotechnical engineers are concerned or civil engineers are concerned but if you want one developments the developments have to happen means then the construction or we have to engineering the ground i think professor madhav is going to give uh, tomorrow then he will actually tell you the importance of engineering the ground now before understanding about uh, you know why we require foundation first of all how the stresses are induced into the soil so if you look into this okay if you see that this particular person is not uh, a soil mechanics uh, person or a, not a trained foundation engineer but uh, he actually has invented a way he can uh, how he can walk on the soft clay uh, with low shear strength you know if you try to walk on soft clay with low shear strength you will get punched into the clay and uh, you will have a punching failure and what you see if uh, failure surrounding your feet that is nothing but a, a punching failure okay so this human object what you are seeing assume that it is 75 kg okay and uh, area of the typical human foot is say 0.08 meter around 8 cm by 20 cm so that is the area so stress caused by the human standing on one foot is 47 kilo pascals so human wearing suppose if you want to any over this suppose if you look into this if you look into this you know then human wearing mat shoes of 0.25 meter diameter which is equal in diameter if you take and this area is 0.049 meter square instead of 0.016 meter square 0.49 meter square so the load divided by area if you put then there is a possibility that the stress will reduce from 47 to 7.7 kilo pascals that means that because of the low induced stress the stress distributed over large area you know we are able to he is able to uh, you know uh, this is for human standing on one foot okay and calculations for one foot if it is for two foot then you actually have to multiply by two okay so what i mean to say is that uh, our uh, mostly that engineering which is there is the most relevant to some of the common sense uh, connected things are there now let us see here how the stress induced uh, to the soil or floor let us say elephant uh, some literature uh, report says that the normal uh, weight of the elephant is about 4.5 tons so we don't know how lord uh, prahlada or prahlada uh, able to sustain that uh, 4.5 tons uh, load okay uh, so 400 diameter 400 mm diameter is the uh, you know the uh, diameter of uh, each elephant elephant foot okay so area is 0.126 meter square so stress generated by elephant is around 89.28 kilo pascals standing on four legs okay so this is about twice the uh, you know stress human standing on one foot so even with the elephant with 4.5 tons 4500 kg uh, elephant is actually generating about 89.28 kilo pascals it is just twice the 
you know stress generated by the human standing on the one foot let us consider uh, a human object wearing let us say heels here okay so approx diameter of the human wearing heels is of 10 mm diameter suppose this one if you take this is 10 mm diameter the area is about 0.7 into 7.85 into 10 power of minus 6 meter square so stress generated by human is about uh, 4700 kilo pascals it is 4.7 mega pascals for standing on two heels so that means that you can see that the stress caused by the uh, human object wearing heels is uh, you know very much high you can see so that uh, maybe the floor types need to sustain uh, you know that much uh, stress for 4700 kilo pascals are 4.7 megapascals so why i told is that these stresses because you know from different sources different uh, you know either from the buildings or from the different uh, sources you actually get the loading to the subsoil now always we look for uh, you know an avenue for transferring the load to the component data uh, you might have already studied and you might have already i think professor uh, gv rao actually has taken and the shallow foundations and all and wherein uh, uh, you know there is a limitation up to some extent where you know you can actually you know place the foundation uh, but sunset certain uh, status you know even after putting the raft or even after putting the pile raft you are actually going to resort to you know transferring the stress to deeper uh, status in that situation you know you are required to go for uh, you know a situation which is called pile foundation let us consider you are having a, a shallow foundation uh, which, which is having a breadth B and a spread footing having B by B dimensions or L by B dimensions and depth D. And uh, if it is subjected to vertical load, uh, say lateral load, vertical load and uh, moment, then you know if the soil is not competent enough, is not able to uh, you know consider uh, consider uh, uh, you know. Uh, you know, endangering with the uh, fact of bearing capacity and settlement, then you need to resort to deep foundation. A deep foundation means that, you know, the predominant one is the pile foundations, where uh, you transfer the stress to the deeper strata, where B is the depth, B is the breadth or diameter, and generally these foundations are square or circular or very rarely octagonal in dimensions. There are different types of classification of the piles which we are going to discuss and these piles will be subjected to vertical load as well as the lateral load as well as the moment load so in view of that actually if you wanted to transfer these loads to deeper uh, strata uh, you know you actually have to have a slender member embedded in the soil so we also decide on the placement embedded depth of the pile or uh, you know termination of the pile depending upon the soil strata uh, which we encounter at a particular site. So why shallow foundation shallow, shallow foundations are not always adopted? Okay. So if you look into that previous uh, figure, we have seen that upper soils are so weak, or and the structural loads are so high that uh, shallow foundations would be too large. You know, I have seen uh, in one uh, mast where uh, you know the height of the mast is mast means as a signboard for Toyota, where height of the mast is 12 meters, the foundation dimension is about 5 meter by 6 meter, 5 meter by 6 meter. So here, uh, one uh, designer, what he has not considered is that Toyota, you know, signboard actually has got uh, coincidentally has two zeros or two O's are there. So because if you are allowing that uh, opening in that Toyota signboard, the moment actually decreases very drastically. Then the foundation size can be optimized. But the upper soils are so weak and the structural loads are so high that shallow footings would be too large. In that case, the foundation is preferred. Upper soils are subject to scour. This is actually possible in river. If you are having in a river scour, there can be possible that up to two to three meters uh, uh, scouring can happen. The foundation will be exposed. Then there will be uh, you know, uh, the PL will be subjected to uh, scour and uh, the bearing failure will happen. This would especially important with foundations for bridges. Okay. If you are, if the bridge is actually crossing, uh, 
you know in visakhapatnam you don't have the bridge crossing the sea but uh, if you look you uh, know mumbai we have bandravalli uh, ceiling bridge where there can be at certain locations that uh, the marines cover can be as large as 10 meters and the foundations uh, also uh, must penetrate through water sometimes uh, you know in case of a river or in case of uh, water table so in that case again uh, you know um, these uh, deep foundations are required a large uplift capacity is required so uplift capacity of the shallow foundations is limited so because of that uh, you know uplift capacity is required means then uh, it has to be you have to retain with the deeper strata and we need to also have large lateral load capacity if you wanted to have large lateral load capacity then that is also a complicated and uh, suppose if there is a future excavation adjacent to the foundation then uh, then there is excavation would undermine the shallow foundation or you know sometimes if you are having a uh, some power grid uh, corporation uh, power grid uh, the trans uh, transformer power grid and all and uh, if you see the one which is on the shallow foundations the one which is on deep foundations uh, the soil suppose if it is close to the river and all you will see that uh, the soil beneath the uh, shallow foundations will get washed off the foundations will get torn but in case of deep foundation that because of the rain, even with the rainfall and all the stability uh, can be ensured and uh, in some of the cases where mat foundation may be appropriate sometimes uh, you know it be economical also and uh, alternative to spread footings and uh, you know you join all the columns suppose you know 50% of the area more than 50% of the area is actually overlapped then you will say that actually you will put a combined mat foundation connecting all all mats but you know sometimes uh, what will happen is that you actually have to have excavation and other issues and all so the mat foundation also has limitations and uh, the the foundation if you look into that it transmits some or all of the upper loads to soils are below the ground surface and these foundations typically extends to the order of 15 meters sometimes nowadays even 45 meters 60 meters depth foundations are coming 45 meters which is actually mentioned even greater lengths are used in the offshore structures drilling platforms and basically soils uh, you know usually improve with the depth the better bubbles a large volume of so deep foundations are often able to so very uh, because of the this reason deep foundations basically able to tack weight uh, handle very large loads also okay so if you look at that it is a foundation system pile foundation system is a a foundation system that transfers the load to a deeper and a competent soil layer okay deeper and competent soil layer sometimes even at the deeper depths also you will not find competent soil strata then here also you need to apply those conditions and so when to use pore fire pile foundations inadequate bearing capacity of shallow foundations and to prevent uplift forces and to reduce excessive settlements okay so if you look into that types of deep foundations if you look in that piles are constructed basically by fabricating slender members or by driving or otherwise forcing them into the ground so piles you know there are also classification we will we'll be discussing about that and drill shafts are constructed by drilling a slender cylindrical hole into the ground inserting reinforcing steel and filling it with concrete this is nothing but a bored cast in situ construction is called kejans are free fabricated boxes or cylinders basically they are fabricated on shore and they are taken on the uh, uh, by towing and then they get sunk at the location so kejans are free fabricated boxes or cylinders that are sunk into the ground uh, to some desired depth then filled with concrete okay these are you know Uh, in Nawshewa and all those places, and this type of kajans were actually used as the sea walls. And mandrel-driven uh, thin shells filled with concrete con uh, consist of corrugated steel shells that are driven into the ground using a mandrel that filled with concrete. So these are uh, mandrel-driven thin shells, kajans, drill shafts, uh, piles. These are different types of uh, deep foundations. Okay. now if you look into this i have been told to the, the classification of the piles so types of piles okay if you look into that there are two major categories or three major categories one is displacement piles other one is non displacement piles 
okay displacement piles and uh, non displacement piles in between there is one more classification which is called low displacement piles okay examples are hitch piles and helical piles helical piles which are now being used for solar panels and all which is uh, you know in in, uh, in steel structures foundation for steel structures and all these helical piles uh, you know have thin shaft maybe about 100 mm diameter and uh, has got one helix or two helix depending upon the requirement and they have very good uh, uplift capacity and uh, also to some extent uh, enhancement in the lateral load capacity okay so these are regarded as the low displacement pipes no no non displacement pipes that means that bored pipes or micro pipes you will excavate and drill the hole and uh, you know bored pipes are basically also they are they are actually because you know you do the excavation and insert the reinforcement gauge and fill it with concrete so this there, there is no you know displacement possibility for the soil but in case of displacement piles one is precast driven what is that precast driven means you actually cast the pile outside and start driving the pile into the ground so that is actually uh, you know uh, totally performed by preformed pipes and this pile actually displaces the soil surrounding soil and makes the space for the pile so it is actually completely displaces the soil another uh, case is that you know sometimes in chemically aggressive places and all the pipe is pipe with the closed uh, bottom will be driven into the ground driven casts to piles so in that uh, pile will be uh, the hole will be made by driving and the reinforcement will be put and casting will be done or sometimes a precast driven pile will be placed into that and filled with the uh, normal concrete so you have displacement piles non displacement piles and low displacement piles example for displacement piles are precast driven pipes example for non displacement piles are bored cast into the pipes and for low displacement piles traditionally h section pipes which are uh, low displacement pipes okay so in a driven cast into the pipes there are two types one is closed end tube concreted with the tube left in the position and steel tube closed end tube and open end tube okay then totally preformed piles hollow small displacement steel pipe piles concrete spun piles is one uh, new buzzword which is actually being used by many people spun piles and a solid and a solid uh, this is called steel hitch piles okay and there is also one more uh, new uh, 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 section which is a type of pile is called fiber reinforced plastic pile particularly for marine environments where the corrosion is actually very severe the fiber reinforced plastic piles frp piles are in use in korea and other countries lot of research is actually happening and also field applications are happening in using fiber reinforced plastic piles uh, for the construction and there is also one more uh, uh, section which is called continuous flight auger piles which also added up very recently okay so classification criteria is that based on the pile material you say that concrete piles steel piles timber piles composite piles okay concrete piles steel piles timber piles composite piles okay so this res with respect to the pile material concrete is it started with timber and then you know replaced by concrete and steel and uh, mostly majority of the piles are made with the concrete piles method of installation when you look into the method of installation driven piles basically they are displacement type bored piles are basically replacement type bored piles are basically a replacement type piles that is that they you remove the soil and replace it with the, Uh, a strong material like concrete then with respect to the soil displacement surrounding the pile high displacement piles and low displacement or non displacement piles okay that is also one classification and size of the pile large diameter piles small diameter piles the diameter of the pile as small as 200 mm diameter is also used and there is also something like uh, 300 mm diameter piles are called micro piles and there is also large diameter piles but a bored cast into the piles are basically 1 meter or 800 mm dia that is the most common 600 mm diameter or 800 mm diameter or 1000 mm diameter nowadays large diameter piles are even going up to 2.5 meters diameter 2500 mm size even 3000 mm size and uh, 
basically for offshore applications, these pipes are being constructed. And with respect to the insta after installation, considering the load transmission, load transmission, considering the load transmission, there are uh, end bearing friction. Two major heads are there from the load transmission, end bearing. End bearing in the sense that pile will pass through the entire weak strata and will get terminated into the competent rock, let us say. Then entire strata is uh, something like is there but not there. Okay, that means that very soft soil. Then in that case, the entire load is transferred to the uh, the deeper strata that is at the bottom depth and bearing piles. Friction piles. For example, if you are trying to design foundation, uh, pile foundation in say Haryana, where you actually have got even 150 meters depth, you are having only uh, soil, then you know you need to actually have a frictional pile foundation. The frictional pile foundation in the sense that it generates the resistance from the surrounding uh, the pile surface, it generates the friction. So friction piles, uh, you know, predominantly, you know, you will find where non-rock uh, bearing areas. For places like Mumbai, the majority of the piles are designed as end bearing piles, where that load is actually transferred to the deeper rock strata or competent rock strata. Sometimes in some soils, sandy soil, clay soil, and then stiff clay, or some dense sand layer, the combination pile, where, you know, which uh, both end bearing and friction is also used. Okay. Very recently, uh, in uh, 2019, Honorable Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi has inaugurated the National Salt Satyagraha Memorial, where uh, IIT Bombay happened to, uh, you know, involved in the design and uh, construction. So where I was actually involved in the design of the foundations uh, for the memorial, uh, so there the soil strata is, you know, upper soil is about 0.5 meter filled up soil, then about uh, six meters or eight meters, the soft clay and uh, very dense sand below. So even the, the below the statue and even the foundation for uh, boundary wall and uh, even for the, you know, some uh, important structures, the entirely we have designed based on the end bearing cum friction piles and bearing cum friction piles and we have used actually precast driven piles because the clay is so soft that it will actually go with the sulfate itself and we actually have rested that in the uh, uh, competent uh, sandy strata to derive so even the mahatma gandhi statue which is about 14 feet or so was actually you know uh, the platform is actually resting on the clay because the site is very close to the Gandhi beach where Mahatma Gandhi picked the uh, first uh, salt in somewhere in April 30. Uh, <clears throat> inclination of the axis of the pile. Sometimes the piles are vertical, sometimes batter. So sometimes uh, depending upon for the, you all must be knowing, you might have seen also bridge, bridge, bridge uh, abutments, you will have a returning wall. And for getting the lateral resistance uh, from the traction forces and all, edge piles will be inclined. That's basically they are called racker piles or batter piles. If the soil is undergoing uh, native skin friction, and if you put uh, batter piles, then there is a possibility that the batter pile will break like a uh, beam. So in case soil is undergoing, say, native skin friction, then the batter piles are not recommended. And variation of cross-section. Sometimes uniform cross section, sometimes tapper piles. See, tapper piles are used sometimes to increase the frictional resistance. Tapper piles are used. Uh, so, what we have seen is that the classification criteria of these piles, uh, you know, based on the variation of the cross section, variation of the inclination of the axis of the pile, and uh, uh, behavior or from the load transmission point of view after installation, size of the pile, and uh, depending upon the uh, depending upon the uh, degree of soil displacement during the installation of driven piles and uh, method of installation and, uh, you know, with respect to the pile material. Okay. Okay. Now, conditions basically that require to use the pile foundations. Basically, if you see that, to transfer the load to the suitable bearing stratum. So what I'm talking is that about this type of bearing stratum, where the end bearing resistance uh, of the piles happen, 
generally we don't place the piles like this uh, resting on the rock we generally take you know minimum two times diameter or three times diameter depending upon the type of the rock or competence of the rock so that is called a socketing depth of the rock socketing depth of the rock so basically to transfer the loads to a suitable bearing stratum by means of a tip or the end bearing resistance of the piles basically this end bearing pile derives most of its capacity from the penetration resistance of the soil at the toe of the pile and pile behave, pile actually behaves like an ordinary column and it should be designed um, uh, except that even in weak soil a pile will not uh, fail by buckling and this effect need only be considered if the pile is actually unsupported it is in either air or water okay so it's almost like uh, you know the pile support with some soil but it is actually you have to see that the pile buckling also should not actually happen <laughs> and uh, you know if uh, as i told you about the frictional pile so here to transfer the loads uh, uh, to the soil gradually by means of the side friction you can see here this is called a frictional pile it is also called as a frictional pile along the length of the pile so load resistance is derived basically from the skin friction load resistance is basically derived from the skin friction okay so frictional pile is basically also termed uh, as floating pile foundation frictional pile is also termed as floating pile foundation because it is not in contact with the it is in contact but the end bearing is not that much high compared to frictional resistance so these piles transfer their load to the ground to the skin friction and uh, the basically the process of driving piles does not compact the soil appreciably okay now uh, basically if you are having a, a swelling soil particularly as i told you um, you know in case if the soil is subject to swelling then the pile actually should be able to tie swelling zone to uh, stable zone so generally in this case in india we actually use uh, a special type of pile which is called under reamed pile foundation but otherwise in case of a swelling soil to carry the foundation through unstable soil and uh, you know are ex expansive or collapsible soil sometimes the soil undergoes a sudden if you do a hydrometer test with a collapsible soil and you will see that sudden catastrophic settlement occurs so that type of uh, you know situations are challenging for the uh, foundation engineers <laughs> and uh, basically to resist and resist actually large lateral loads you can see here so that is actually done through uh, you know by resisting through the uh, lateral load resistance of the pile foundation tall building subject to wind load or earthquake load or fender fender of a ship okay and uh, uplift basically to resist uplift uh, uh, forces the pile will be subject to uplift so this again again done through the frictional resistant which actually acts in downwards in addition the self weight of the pile also acts downward if you wanted to increase the uplift capacity of the pile one advantage is that you just uh, you know what you have to do is that you actually have to increase the diameter of the pile okay uh, offshore platforms basement mats or transmission line towers all these are actually subjected to uplift piles subjected to uplift suppose if a transmission line tower is there let us assume that the the tower rope got cut so there is a no balance in the moment what will happen one side of the pile foundation get lifted up so that means that that particular one has to have uplift resistance and as i as i told you by um, the pier foundations are this foundation subjected to erosion as cover and that can actually you know uh, require the if you are actually putting a foundation like this then there is a possibility that uh, the pier will get tilted but if you are having a deeper uh, strata the foundation uh, Through the depth of this cover, then there is a possibility that you'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, have sustained uh, foundation which can take the load properly. So there are some tension piles. You can see that special type of pile, a tension pile and compression pile in case of a wind. So if wind load is acting like this, the structure actually put a. If this is the direction of the wind, the compression and tension. Okay. and this is the racker or batter piles which i was actually mentioning for a retaining wall and uh, it's not very popular but in the literature it actually if you are having a rock which is bedding like this and if there is uh, you know some sort of uh, shear which is happening 
there is something called shear pipes. That means that you drill through the rock, you drill through the rock, and you actually have, uh, you know, uh, installed piles so that the shearing can actually can reduce. Uh, so this is actually a very interesting one. You have multiple joints. If you have got multiple joints, one joint and all, you can see that you can do rock bolting and all. But you have got multiple joints, then one of the alternatives is to go for shear pipes. So this is not very popular, but uh, very interesting as far as uh, uh, you know application is concerned. Nowadays in the urban areas, I'm sure in Vishakhapatnam and some other places also, these are actually coming. We have two types, uh, pile walls, pile walls which are coming. We also have diaphragm walls, but they are costly. But for normal construction, uh, people use uh, secant piles or contiguous piles. In contiguous piles, almost piles will be touching each other. There will be a 100 mm gap or so. And, uh, you know, that is basically to allow the water flow and all. And uh, if there is no water table and all, you use this one. Contiguous pile, it is called. The other one is that uh, first uh, they will actually put uh, these uh, precast. They will drill a hole and put a precast pile. And uh, they drill another hole. And inside, they put the reinforcement and put the reinforced concrete pile. So if you if you see here, uh, this particular yellow portion is uh, you know with made of concrete. And this is actually used for putting anchors and some other areas. And uh, in, in this actually helps even to uh, you know seal the. Uh, suppose if there is a deep excavation happening, adjacent area groundwater table is there, and you wanted to seal the groundwater table from escaping, then this is one of the best methods. So this is for second wall for hard, soft, or hard film strata. In case of hard strata, people use also this type of arrangement, wherein you actually have got. Uh, uh, precast pine with a certain gap then in between you drive another uh, reinforced concrete so this and this and all reinforced concrete and this and all is uh, precast concrete and uh, for increasing the you know some uh, stiffness and uh, instead of uh, uh, this uh, in the second pine uh, we can also put the i section recently we have used it in one of the uh, you know metro the Mumbai Metro uh, Rail Corporation, and they are, they were actually excavating, uh, you know, 1.5 meter away from the existing flyover. So where we actually use you this, and then now the construction actually is almost coming to end, and the metro work is actually progressing well. So there, you know, they use this uh, reinforcement in place of uh, uh, this conventional reinforcement. They have used an I section, and uh, because you know the the reason why they have used this. Uh, um, you know, small 300 mm diameter because the rig cannot stand there because there is a flyover standing above it. So to do the work below the flyover, they actually have done with a low headroom rig. Okay. So if the pile based shoring uh, system to support the deep excavation. Suppose if you are having existing building and if somebody actually purchases uh, this flat, then they wanted to go to uh, you know two basements or three basements. Then you know you want to retain this. It's one of the best alternatives is to protect this building. And if this building happens to be a, a religious building of importance, then uh, one has to take all the precautions in protecting the building. This is uh, one type of uh, contiguous wall where you can see that uh, uh, the gap between the piles. You can see here the gap between the piles are shown here. You can see here. And uh, the piles uh, which are formed may be about 800 mm diameter. And we can see here, second pile. So what I was actually telling you is that this is the secondary piles and which is actually shown here. You can see that this is the secondary pile which is actually shown here. Okay, you can see here, these are the secondary piles. So this is for, uh, you know, either for suppose for the metro construction or for some other purposes, these are actually required to be operated. Then you can see that this is uh, one, uh, you know, typical basement construction where they cast like this and prop like this and even lower the construction equipment also through this and then operate and then they go down in steps like this. So you can see that these are the, uh, you know, completed pipes. There's, there is some sort of groundwater uh, coming out also. Okay. So you can see that, uh, you know, the how these uh, deep excavations are actually happening. Uh, even in, in India, 
and major major parts of mumbai also these are happening very very regularly now okay now why the foundations are required <clears throat> this is in march 11 when the earthquake actually has come in japan this building is on pile foundation and the surrounding areas are not on pile foundations so you can see that japanese will never construct the side walks and all like this with the different uh, uh, undulations and all okay so this building uh, tallest building uh, is standing and not as if nothing has happened but uh, the interpretations of that you know uh, what happened during the earthquake is that the building which is on uh, competent uh, pile foundation found to behave in a better way compared to the building without shallow foundations where you know subjected to decaction or due to some other this thing so that is actually is one thing which is uh, you know is categorically represented here okay. now sometimes uh, uh, you know uh, based on the uh, depth of the piles and all uh, if you are actually having a uh, pile foundations here pile foundations here then the proposed development then minimum number of bore holes are required and uh, then you can actually uh, you know develop the uh, you know with minimum number of uh, bore holes you can design the foundation always we look for what is the edges and foundations and what type of things they adopted and all those things okay so when you look into the driven cast in situ pile basically the driven cast in situ pile is formed in the ground by driving a casing um, permanent or temporary sometimes if it is permanent it will be very costly and uh, subsequently the filling in the hole with the plain or reinforced concrete okay okay this is uh, driven cast in situ pile and basically this type of pile the subsoil is displaced by driving uh, of the casing which is installed with a plug or shoe at the bottom so when the casing is left permanently it is termed as a cased pipe and if it is removed then it is called uncased pipe in case of marine situation the cased case casing is left there and it is accounted for the cost of the pipe so it is called cased pipe otherwise it is called as uncased pipe in case of the piles which are driven with temporary casing they are called as uncased pipes and the concrete poured inside in situ comes to direct contact with the soil so the concrete may be rammed or vibrated so that depending upon the um, system of the piling adopted so basically this type of piles find where applications where the pile is required to be taken to greater depth to find adequate bearing strata and all okay and it uh, and also to generate adequate skin friction between the surrounding soil and the pile surface um, uh, so this is uh, you know adopted so if you look into that this is the schematically which is represented uh, for the driven cast in situ pile which is called dcis pile and which is also being nowadays used as one of the methods for liquefaction remediation okay why because here if you are having some uh, sand clay and some sand deposit sand loose sand and sand and some uh, clay then the when the pile is actually driven uh, this is uh, you know the uh, described in by keller uh, is that you know you drive the pile vertically down and uh, remove it remove it and lower the reinforcement and uh, also gradually can remove the casing also so what will happen is that before casing before uh, before dcs if the n value is like this and after uh, placement of the dcs pile if you conduct the uh, standard penetration test you will actually see that the surrounding soil will get uh, densified so this is also very recently in fact in one of the sites in pardeep where we are actually using this as the liquefaction remediation technique by using dcis pile that is called driven cast in situ pile okay so the driven cast in situ pile means you actually have got very nice hole form because you displaced the surrounding soil and uh, placed the reinforcement and filled with the concrete bore cast in situ pipes okay here what we said this is a low displacement pile the piles formed within the ground by excavating or boring a pile within it or with or without the use of the temporary casing and subsequently filling it with plain or reinforced concrete mostly reinforced concrete in case of secondary pipes it will be plain plain concrete pipes so here also when the pile is casing is left permanently it's called cased pile and when casing is taken before the concrete is set they will actually remove the casing 
it's called uncased pile. So it's installed in a board pile. The sides of the bore's bore hole is required to be stabilized with the aid of a temporary casing or, or drilling mud. Nowadays, uh, people are using uh, uh, you know polymer-based drilling mud in this pile foundation construction. So per, uh, per marine situation, such as piles are formed with uh, permanent casing, as I told you, that is actually with the always the casing piles are used. So how you know the board casting into pile construction happen? For those uh, you know, you actually have uh, uh, starter casting that is, you have a casing and removal of the soil and you pump the slurry. Okay, so like this you go down and you you can actually keep there and then start uh, you know excavating down and keep the slurry. Basically this. Uh, the finish the excavation and boring clean borehole. So this these are the stages that, that place the steel casing and the C is that uh, you know uh, this is B pump the slurry and the C is that uh, you know finish excavation or boring and clean borehole and placing the reinforcement cage and uh, D by putting placing the concrete because of the density that uh, slurry will come out concrete will go out con concrete will go inside. So you can see the slurry explored by the concrete. Then you will see the remove the termi pipe. Then you will see a reinforced concrete pipe pile. Board catches the concrete pile forms. So you can see that a typical uh, BCS piles which are actually formed. A schematic way how you know the board catches into pile construction happens. Sometimes uh, you know when soils are uh, you know highly notorious for. Uh, caving and uh, you know before you put the concrete there can be some uh, casing so this is called the necking of the piles so what will happen is that you always uh, the life is not like this you know you actually have before uh, you know so you pour the concrete so you will see that sometimes only reinforcement will be there in the center and it just it is the void of the concrete so that is called the necking of the concrete so this is actually nowadays uh, you know i think you also have a lecture by uh, Ravikir and Vaija. So he is going to talk about uh, you know, where the necking will come and uh, which pile will come, whether the piles are being casted properly or not. All those things can be uh, you know discussed, uh, uh, you know, can be detected by using uh, you know uh, this uh, integrity testing. Okay. So uh, you know this is uh, using uh, the casing uh, to deal with the case. So one one way to resolve this one is to use the casing in that area you install casing uh, to take care of the caving of the soil to take care of the caving of the soil and then you use that uh, casing so, so they protect the side walls of the uh, uh, you know soil uh, from caving by using some casing protection okay. so this is a large diameter uh, uh, board catches into piles uh, you know construction as i was telling you that there can be 2.5 meter or 3 meter diameter Piles. Okay, and uh, basically, when you are actually trying to construct uh, large diameter piles and all, you need uh, large uh, drilling uh, pits because, particularly, the excavation in the the drilling in the hard rock is very very difficult. The socketing piles in the bedrock is very very difficult. So, if you look into this here, uh, you know these uh, you know drilling pits are very very. Um, you know, uh, you know, very much required in establishing uh, the proper socketing in the hard rock. Okay, so you always, uh, you know, there is a, you know, sometimes actually uh, we also have end bearing pile to get the more bearing resistance. You know, this type of uh, bell shaped end bearing piles. That means that the bulb actually will get enlarged at the base, basically to give a lot of end bearing resistance. That's called bell shaped and bearing pile. And I was actually mentioning you about uh, under the pile foundations for the um, expansive soil conditions. What I will say that, you know, under the pile foundations are one of the uh, Indian inventions have gone into the world. Where you can see that um, this uh, under the pile foundations may be around three to four meters because expansive soils are active up to four meters, particularly the soils in and around Maharashtra. And other places, the activity, what what we say that active zone is about four meters to five meters. Length. So that is in that zone, the moisture fluctuations happen, and below that, because of the water burden as well as other reasons, there is a possibility that 
uh, a swelling tendency will be less. So because of that, the up to four meters, the effectiveness will be very high. So swelling. Uh, so in this case, the board calcium pseudopites will look like this. And here, uh, like almost like uh, this type of mechanism, you will see a formation of a bell will happen, but it is a small scale. Okay. So you can see that the underneath bulbs have T1, theta 1, theta 2, and uh, theta 1 uh, may be around 30 degrees to 45 degrees. Theta 2 is also of 45 degrees or so. Okay. So sometimes 200 bulbs are there. From the research, actually, it has been found out that more than 200 bulbs actually results like a cylindrical failure. So the IS code recommends uh, codes uh, with, uh, you know, uh, one, uh, one rim bulb or two under rim bulbs. For expansive soils, at least uh, the first bulb has to be 1.7 times the uh, 7.5 7 meters below the below the surface of the soil or two times the diameter of the under rim bulb. Okay. Driven precast concrete pipes or precast driven pipes. So precast driven pipes, in fact, uh, while I was working in uh, IIT Madras, uh, 89, uh, uh, 90 or so, I was actually privileged to have, uh, you know, seen about more than, uh, you can say that uh, 1,000 to uh, 2,000 piles which are installed and about 60 to 70 piles which are tested at uh, Reliance uh, uh, plant in uh, Azira. Okay. So I used to, you know, represent uh, from IAP uh, Madras and somebody from the LNT they used to represent. Okay, so the, it actually has given a lot of learning experience about the piles and particularly about the testing. And uh, the second thing is that, um, you know, uh, how, you know, why and how soil mechanics is actually important in, uh, you know, developing a particular plant. So driven precast concrete pile is a pile constructed in a casting yard and subsequently driven into the ground with or without jetting. So sometimes uh, below the pile, there is a possibility that you will actually jet the, you will create localized liquefaction and uh, with the pile sulfate itself keeps on going. Or otherwise you have to have, uh, you know, uh, you know, hammer, which actually pushes the pile into the ground. Other techniques like pre-boring, and when the pile has attained the sufficient strength. By, then the, by driving, the subsoil is displaced and remaining in direct contact with the pile. So when the surrounding soil is gets displaced, the pile actually, surrounding soil surrounding the pile will be in a highly compacted state, offers also more resistance. And these piles find wide application, particularly structures such as valves, jetties, etc. Basically, you know, uh, for the uh, uh, ethylene storage tanks, but different units which are there, and uh, we actually have, uh, you know, uh, kept on, you know, doing, uh, seeing how, you know, the foundations are actually casted and uh, what are the difficulties in driving precast driven piles at the site and all. We tried to understand in, uh, you know, somewhere around uh, 89, 90. That was at that time I was actually repenting myself that I was not getting a proper uh, job and all. But uh, I, today, I actually treat that actually as is a, a memorable experience. Okay, so then uh, we also have uh, piles because we don't use uh, piles alone. We actually also, you know, club them. Okay, that means that you have a group of piles always. Okay, so pile group is basically a set of piles. Basically, they have a pile cap that uh, means that they act together to carry the load. Okay, so pile cap would normally be in contact with the ground. But uh, pile cap will not offer any resistance. But in case of pile raft, raft foundation that has actually piles to reduce the amount of settlement, and raft foundation and the piles would be designed to act to the uh, to ensure the required settlement is not exceeded. And major part of the bearing capacity comes from the raft rather than the rather than the piles. In case of uh, pile group, major part of the load resisting is actually coming from the piles either resting in the competent strata or on the uh, socketed into the competent rock okay so there is pile group versus pile uh, uh, raft and uh, where uh, uh, alpha pr is equal to one means represents a pile group in which top is not in contact with the soil and the system functions as a pile raft okay so these details i'm not going into detail so a raft foundation 
and sometimes the settlements are high at the center end on being a flexible uh, condition settlement reducer piles are also used settlement reduction and reduction pressure on the raft uh, this actually makes the pressure base of the pressure base of the raft the pressure will be reduced and uh, optimization in the raft thickness can be done and pile foundation pile only support here and pile raft foundation additional raft support and uh, so this is actually a cost the, if you look into this this is cost effective and this is an improvement uh, with the enhancement okay now what you see is the uh, burj khalifa tower you know which is uh, the tallest one and uh, pile raft supporting the 160 storied burj khalifa uh, is actually uh, the foundation looks like this one so you can see that uh, the shape of that uh, maybe at the base it looks like that and uh, founded on 3.7 meter thick raft uh, 3.7 meter thick raft supporting the supporting 1.5 meter diameter uh, board cast in situ piles you can see here these are the board cast in situ piles so this is the foundation for uh, 160 story so 160 story means about uh, 500 meters of a kilometers height okay precast given piles basically they are casted uh, at the art and uh, cured properly with proper nowadays there, there is also possibility that you can do uh, pre-stressing also to reduce the cross section and uh, <coughs> there can be uh, square solid and square hollow octagonal solid or octagonal hollow is actually possible okay and nowadays these are also coming with frp piles also okay so here um, uh, you know when you are actually nowadays uh, what is happening is that handling you know 25 meter 50 meter piles is very difficult by using cranes because the driving stresses will be very very high so what is being done is that the splicing of the piles is happening so first they will drive 10 meters pile and they will hold and stop driving after reaching uh, say 9 meter and then they will put another pile and the splice the ends both and then they both actually make it like a monolithic one and start driving so these are actually called nowadays uh, you know spliced piles so very interesting to know the load carrying capacity of the spliced piles with one joint two joints three joints how the lateral load is actually happening and how the vertical load is actually you know uh, you know these one thing is that the splicing has to be perfect so that the pile behaves like a monolithic piece so you can see that here uh, there is a rig which actually hold this is actually maybe a diesel gen, diesel uh, rig which actually drives the pile into the ground sometimes so if the soil is uh, you know soft you know by holding the pile with the self of the pile itself you see that the pile actually enters into the ground so here what will happen is that the pile reaches the competent strata and uh, in fact when we are discussing the dynamic formula tomorrow we'll be discussing also what is the set value when you can say that the pile actually reaches the competent strata so here these are the you know you can see here um, these are the precast driven pipes which are actually uh, driven for certain uh, uh, maybe construction okay so board cast into two concrete piles board precast board sorry board precast concrete piles okay so here um, there will be a board hole will be there but in this case what you will do you will, you will drill a hole it's a low displacement hole only but in this case afterwards you will put a precast pile into the ground and fill it with concrete so board precast concrete pile is a pile constructed in a casting yard and subsequently lowered into pre-board holes and the space is grouted so surrounding space is grouted so that you will get pile soil contact so these piles found wide applications where basically if you are having a chemically aggressive subsoil and the uh, and the groundwater condition such protection is uh, possible and with board precast concrete piles because these are basically made using vibrated dense and matured concrete low water and low water cement ratio so the penetration of the chemically aggressive uh, you know uh, entities into the pile will be limited and there and another thing is that because the hole is already uh, pre-driven the pile will not be subjected to any driving so the driving stresses uh, will be very less and uh, maybe 20 meters 30 meters uh, you know that can be achieved so these are basically used when artesian conditions are existing 
or where the local obstructions basically encountered in finding in uh, above the founding level or a subsoil water flow occurs okay nowadays uh, for the youngsters actually uh, one uh, advantages which is coming is that you know you actually have got a pile but inside area is almost like a, a not a place so people are thinking about uh, geothermal piles and which is also called as energy piles and uh, you know for countries like western and european countries and uh, which we have not practiced that but uh, they are they are actually installing uh, the coolants and as well as the heating pumps basically to control the climatic controls of the buildings and all so geothermal piles basically are consistent of the pile foundations combined with the closed loop down surface uh, heat system and their purpose is to provide support to the building as well as to the act as a heat source and heat sink uh, to the system basically in this effect the principle is that thermal mass of the ground enables the building to store unwanted heat from cooling systems and allows the heat pumps to warm the building in the winter so this is actually a dual purpose and which is actually gaining popularity in western and european countries and it's one of the economical systems maybe it involves about some 20% additional cost but it actually serves the purpose so this in geothermal piles the pipe loops are very, uh, laid vertically in order to in order for it to be possible for the incorporated in the pile foundations okay so these are the geothermal piles you can see that the principle actually is shown here and uh, you know where you actually have got the pile and uh, which is geothermal loops are actually installed and integrated with this and the heat pump is placed in the basement and all and actually it serves as a so you can able to control the building temperature and all and these are actually called as energy piles which are recent in uh, as far as india is concerned we can say that we are very very much in the nascent stage okay so this is another view of uh, how kita they doing installation of the uh, you know so now now you know because of this you know when the surrounding soil is actually getting uh, heated up then what is happening to load carrying capacity so many issues many researchers actually working in this area so these geothermal piles are also known as heat exchanger or energy piles and the dual purpose for supporting the structure as well as the har harvesting the shallow geothermal energy is basically an innovative and a sustainable method for the energy conservation okay so this is a repetition which i have said and uh, very recently we actually have done uh, you know installation of uh, helical piles uh, at uh, one of the sites in bangladesh so you can see that uh, the, the helical pile uh, you know, is being driven into the ground and uh, this is a single pile so which actually derives the capacity and the solar panel is attached so this is the shaft of the solar panel and below that is a helical panel foundation is gone so single pipe which actually has got lateral load capacity of required capacity so we, in fact we have done some innovative methods wherein we have connected all these uh, uh, you know panels so that uh, the lateral load resistance could be increased so this is again energy piles the original literature which i have mentioned here and uh, this is one of the brand actually has uh, given very interesting paper where uh, you know incorporating a, a heat exchanger system with deep drilling foundations this uh, is basically buried under the ground okay so this uh, you know uh, winter operation summer operation it's a dual one so concerns regarding the potential in part of the temperature cycle cycle 1 cycle 2 cycle 3 on the structural performance of the pipe is all this being investigated now so what i mean to say is that this is one of the very recent areas even in the western and european countries but these are actually slowly may come to maybe some parts of india uh, maybe in the near future okay continuous flight auger piles which actually i mentioned in the beginning as one of the Uh, you know, recent, uh, uh, recently, uh, buzzword which is actually appearing, CFA pipes. It's called. Basically, these are constructed rotating in order to uh, stream into the ground by injecting the uh, concrete under minimum pressure. So you, the, uh, you, you basically drill it, and uh, after design test is reached, and auger uh, withdrawal, 
and the concrete injection up to the borehole mouth and enforcement gauge position. This enforcement gauge positioning is done before and after. This is more or less actually here. What happens is that this other continuous augering of the pile. So it's called that's a continuous flight auger, continuous auger pile, suitable for medium dense sands and gravels, and stiff place, not preferable, recommended for very soft place and loose sands and gravels. So this is for medium dense sands and gravels and stiff place. These continuous uh, flight auger piles are very popularly used. Now, when you look into the piles before calculating the load carrying capacity, we should understand uh, what are the different failure modes of piles. Failure modes of piles. Here, as I told, uh, when you are hanging, a, when you are actually embedding on the uh, competent strata, the pile will get socketed into the uh, rock. Then, you know, when you are, this soil is not competent enough to offer any lateral resistance to the pile, the pile will be subjected to buckling. So this is the Q versus sediment, this is the buckling load. And L is the length of the bearing, length of the bearing. And uh, uh, here. Your voice is not clear, sir. Vishnadam, sir. Okay, okay. Now, Some problem with the voice. No, 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 it is. No, Hello? Hello, how is, how it is now? It is still low, sir. It, it is coming as if from a very low point. No, it was fine, sir. Right now, it has got disturbed. Maybe your mic something. Hello, now? Now is this OK? Yeah, now it is fine, sir. OK. Thank you. And uh, the presentation is audio, uh, vis visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is all fine. OK, OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, maybe from the previous slide, it has happened. Continuous flight target. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, OK. So maybe uh, on its own, it got changed, I think. The continuous flight auger piles basically are constructed, um, rotating an auger string into the ground by injecting concrete under a minimum pressure to the whole. The, basically here, the when the excavation is actually happening, through this central shaft, you know, the concrete is pumped. So that's why this system, which is actually called continuous flight auger system, so the concrete is pumped through the through the shaft. And when the concrete is green, then the reinforcement uh, 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 cage is actually driven into the ground. OK, so that's why this is uh, you know continuous flight auger pile. So more or less, it looks like uh, uh, you know, is in um, uh, method for like bird catches into pile only. But uh, a different types of different type of uh, installation of the pile is actually adopted here. Is again low displacement pile only. Okay. Then when we said is that buckling is uh, in a very weak soil, there is a possibility that buckling can happen. And another thing is that suppose if the competent rock is uh, not strong enough, let's assume that it's like a chalk. You know the chalk which you take uh, for writing the uh, is like a sandstone or soft rock. You know. Then in that case, what will happen? The pile will undergo a general shear failure. Basically, here at deeper uh, strata, where we all know that and always uh, there is a possibility that uh, the punching shear failure takes place. The pile will get punched into the ground. Okay, and uh, soil of uniform strength means you know you will have a failure like this, and uh, the load carrying capacity will be like this. And uh, suppose uh, low strength soil in the lower layer and uh, high strength soil on the top then you actually have uh, behavior like this and uh, skin friction is in tension means then you actually have this type of behavior okay so these are the typical failure modes which are shown in this slide now there are indian standard codes which are uh, i request uh, you to now you know you is possible for you to download uh, i is 2911 part one concrete piles the section one is driven cast in situ concrete piles. Section two, board cast in situ concrete piles. Section three is a driven uh, precast concrete piles. And section four is uh, board precast concrete piles. So each each uh, pile, whatever we have discussed, you know, there is, uh, you know, code existing on it. 
and uh, part two is timber piles and part three is underrimmed piles and uh, part four is pile load test uh, you know where uh, the type of pile loads test which are required like initial and routine tests and all they are prescribed there now for the integrity testing and all those things and all now the new codes also have come so how to select a pile you know for, for basically you know which type of pile to be selected type of piles available in the market installation method for example <coughs> if you are having a rock there and if you select a pre-cost driven pile then pile cannot be driven and the pile will be subjected to continuous breakage okay and the ground conditions suppose if the limestone is there and the site conditions accessibility whether you'll be able to bring heavy uh, you know precast uh, driven pipes to the site or not whether the pre construction of the yards are possible or not all sorts of things and the magnitude of loading and development program and cost okay now uh, for the analysis and design of the single piles as far as single piles is concerned i will be telling with this very very simple method the piles must be able to uh, sustain axial and lateral loads basically i'll concentrate on the axial loading and lateral load i think is being discussed separately okay <coughs> so you can see here pile is subjected to socketing here this is the socketing depth okay so what we do is that by ignoring the side frictional resistance we take this as the uh, tip resistance or bearing resistance and this is the frictional resistance if somebody asks you for the end bearing pile what is the free body diagram means you actually have to say load applied and uh, this force this uh, end bearing resistance and friction resistance and uh, the self weight of the pile acting downwards now for the uh, for the in order to resist the structural load q <coughs> The, the load is actually nothing but QB plus QS. QB is nothing but uh, uh, bearing, bearing uh, and bearing resistance at the pipe tip into bearing area. It can be bearing area of uh, area of the cross section of the pipe and uh, summation of the frictional resistance from uh, pi DL into that entire area. So this is nothing but the based on the static formula what we call QB plus QS is equal to total q so qb and qs are fundamentally different modes of resistance basically it is customary to evaluate each each of them separately okay so qb ab is the tip resistance and qsi as summation from i to 1 to n is number of layers okay is uh, is the frictional resistance okay now when you have the downward uh, frictional load as i told you uh, for this, Q allowable load is equal to Q ultimate by factor of safety. Now, when uh, when you have got uh, Q allowable, QT plus QS minus WP by factor of safety. So this is also called as uh, you know QT dash plus uh, QS. That is QT minus WP. I'm taking the weight of the pile and QT dash plus QS by factor of safety. So uh, you know this uh, you know should be. Uh, you know, design load should be less than or equal to Q allowable load. In case of upward, when you are taking float or tension, we don't take the end bearing into consideration. We take the friction resistance into consideration. And this is valid for L by D, that length to diameter, uh, that is slenderness ratio greater than 6. According to Kulhave, for L by D less than 6, a cone of soil will be formed around the pile and during an upward failure, it reduces upward capacity. So this is actually said to be, uh, you know, valid for L by D greater than six. Okay. And the mobilized, uh, you know, factor of uh, friction resistance uh, is less uh, uh, for the uh, uplift in case of than the downward loading. Okay. So the transfer of the compressive axial loads from a deep foundation into the ground by the side friction and the toe bearing means this is how actually one represents the transform uh, the transfer of the loads okay now let us discuss uh, about the how the 
pile axial load transfer mechanism happens okay let us consider a pile and uh, it is uh, has both end bearing as well as frictional resistance so let us say that if q is the load but q1 q2 q3 q4 are the set of the loads where i am actually uh, let us say one story building construction represents q1 two story building construction represents q2 like that qn like that is there so for smaller load whatever the load you apply first the frictional resistance mobilizes along the uh, upper section of the slope so for uh, upper section of the pipe that is dda then you know you try to increase the load then some more frictional resistance will some frictional resistance completely will get mobilized then after anything load applied more than q2 now the frictional resistance is completely mobilized now the end bearing resistance mobilization for for mobilization of the end bearing resistance a penetration of about 10 to 25 percent of d is required the pile actually have to penetrate 10 to 25 percent is required into the strata for uh, for mobilization of the frictional resistance you require only 0.25 to 1 percent of the d so first frictional resistance will get mobilized whatever it is and then the end bearing resistance will get mobilized okay so schematic load versus settlement diagram if the if i look into this i actually have uh, you know for the load carried by the shaft total load or if load carried by the shaft or frictional resistance is this and this is combination of end bearing as well as frictional resistance okay now as i discussed actually displacement piles and non displacement piles that is example is that board cast in situ piles or uh, you know uh, precast driven piles so in the case of displacement piles the yellow color you can see that it uh, generates the higher load with less settlement but in case of a partially displacement pile or uh, you know non displacement piles you have a less load carrying capacity because here the surrounding soil is not compacted offers less resistance in the case of displacement piles soil gets preloaded during installation and much larger settlements are required for mobilization of the given load okay so here uh, in between this is called partial displacement piles the load this is a schematic load versus settlement diagram for displacement and non displacement piles okay so this is the typical uh, load displacement curve for an actually loaded pipe okay so uh, with this actually i will stop uh, wherein uh, we discussed about the classification of the piles as well as uh, uh, you know uh, we also discussed about uh, the new piles even continuously uh, flight augured piles where you actually have formed the piles uh, while drilling while augering itself okay and we discussed about helical piles which is also another new type of low displacement piles which are actually coming up and we try to discuss and define the static formula then further actually we look into uh, in maybe in the tomorrow's lecture uh, about uh, uh, you know the load calculations and uh, the single piles and uh, you know particularly how the negative skin friction if it is there how it is actually going to affect and then we'll try to you know solve some problems wherein uh, you'll be able to uh, get some insight into whatever we have discussed with the theory and what, when we are doing we will try to do as per the is code so that means that you know you have a tendency to look into the is code and the application of is code for uh, pile foundation design thank you very thank much for a very detailed lecture explaining about classification of pile and introducing to the concept of load carrying capacity of pile tomorrow morning session hopefully participants will be looking for uh, uh, determining load capacity using static and uh, dynamic formulae so uh, we, uh, i request uh, the participants to pose uh, questions or queries if they have any uh, navin chandra is asking why is pile uh, socketing why the pile is socketed 
Ah, yeah, yeah. So generally, what happens is that uh, generally, if you are having a weathered rock or a competent rock, the prime is required to be socketed uh, up to certain depth. Particularly when you are actually doing, say, from the lateral road resistance point of view, or if you are using for depending upon the uh, you know uh, purpose. So in that situation, what happens is that. Uh, the pile is mandated to be socketed but you know if you say that the pile uh, you know 3d three times d socketing drilling in the rock is uh, very cumbersome many times uh, people tend to you know eliminate that but you know if you are actually having uh, you know even in the earthquake when amplification happens and uh, the pile is uh, standing on the rock but no socketing but there is a possibility that you know those amplifications and uh, you know rocking type of these things will happen so this uh, high rise buildings particularly uh, are deep excavations which are actually happening and as per the indian standard code uh, depending upon the type of the rock you actually need to have a minimum socketing of one day if the rock is very highly competent one highly competent in the sense that it is like something like a mumbai rock where uh, basalt or granite rock which is very very hard then you know one day socketing Otherwise, if the rock is not competent enough, even we have the cases of, uh, you know, socketing up to 3D, 3 times D. Any more rocks? Thank you, Naveen Chandra. So maybe Sorry. if you have any other queries tomorrow morning also you can uh, yeah uh, Professor Ishlan sir will be here for the morning session. So not only related to this topic uh, in general with respect to shallow or deep foundation, if you have any query uh, you can ask. About 30, 40, 40, 40. These are all faculty, uh, Dr. Professor Reddy. Uh, faculty members, majority are faculty members, sir. And they are from different colleges. Practicing engineers. Mm -hmm. Practicing engineers are there, about 20 number. Mm -hmm. research okay, okay. Actual strength is about 75, sir. Mm -hmm. So, because of uh, uh, routine works. Which uh, okay. they avoid when they are logging going out. Okay, okay. So uh, we are seeing a number of oh, about 75. Okay, you are actually allowing only up to 75. Uh, actually, as the ASP, uh, their uh, the sanction number is only 50 mm. minimum. So we can, we can and, have uh, extra because it is online thing. Huh? And uh, these faculty are from different places, huh? Are different places. Okay, very good. Different parts of uh, India from different okay. states. Very, very, very good. Okay. And there is also a participant from uh, Mauritius attending okay. this. Okay, okay. Very recently, I have done one work in Mauritius actually for MRT system. Uh, is that a participant here? Morning session, he was there. Okay, okay. Now there, I have used, uh, you know, lime stable, lime column, lime stabilization. Okay, sir. Uh, why? Because it's a marine clay, and uh, the already structure has been constructed. So in order to improve the ground, so I have used uh, our uh, IIT Madras uh, Professor uh, Nelson Rao's uh, guidance okay. and uh, you know blessings. So okay. where I could complete that one. Sir, even on the also in uh, some structures where problems were there, uh, he has uh, supervised some uh, lime grot. Yes, yes. yes, yes. So immediately I could get his number and I construct I contacted him and then he guided me, you know, very systematically. Sir, <laughs> sir there is one more question in the chat box, sir. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not seeing the chat box actually. Uh, in Plaxis while modeling file, it should be modeled as elastic or plastic material. It is actually modeled as elastic material only. Soil only, elastoplastic, mm -hmm. and uh, mostly elastic only. So we have finished exact plan time, sir. Yeah, yeah. Five o'clock. And tomorrow is nine thirty, na? Eight thirty, sir. Eight thirty. Hey, eight thirty. Eight thirty. Then I have to. We are making parts and space so that they can attend to their. Okay, okay. I was uh, so eight eight thirty eight thirty to ten o'clock, ah? Yes, sir. One o'clock. Oh ha ha. Then uh, I have to take from home. Then okay, I'll take. Uh, yeah. So I think, sir, next week I may come to Vaisag actually, February. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, after this lockdown, maybe I'll contact you over the phone. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll be coming. Uh, so, ready, Garu? Uh, yes, uh, maybe we'll meet tomorrow once again. So thank you very much. No, I remember and I will join 8.30, no? so I will put, uh, I will change in my mobile, otherwise okay. Okay. <laughs> this is a problem. Because I I actually, yeah, I actually, so yeah, yeah it's, I marked as uh, this thing and then tomorrow I am conducting one uh, guest lecture okay. for uh, foundation engineering for uh, for my M Tech and PhD students, somebody from uh, outside industry they are giving lecture actually so there is internal just for students now so nowadays everything is possible so we are just uh, asking some of the industry friends to you know deliver lectures to these amtech and phd students so uh, if no further